Hi, I'm Alexis with Local Ambrosia, and today we'll be doing one of our household's ultimate favorites, carnitas. Carnitas is probably one of those traditional Mexican food dishes that you probably only get when you go out to eat, but you might be surprised at how easy it is to make it at home. We'll start by seasoning our meat. Our butcher has all of their pork roasts or rounds or butts or shoulders. There's so many different names for this dish, it almost gets confusing. But if you go to your butcher and tell them what you're making, they'll be able to help you out. This was pre-cut at five pounds. Ours has a bone in, which we'll leave in for cooking and flavor. But we'll start by trimming away all the excess fat that's there. Carnitas is a really rich dish. And there's a lot of marbling in the pork itself, so I don't feel too bad cutting off all that extra fat. All right, we'll discard our fat and work on our seasonings. So for this dish, I like to keep it really simple by using some cumin, garlic powder, salt and pepper. The cumin gives it a nice smoky flavor and it really is what reminds me of Mexican food. And be liberal with it. You see how thick this is. So you wanna make sure that all of your seasoning on the outside will be flavorful enough to get through to the middle. Lots of garlic powder. I usually prefer fresh garlic, but for a dry rub, there's really no comparison. Now for, and I use about equal amounts of all ingredients or seasonings here. And what I did for this is I usually have my pepper mill that I love so much, but that would be so tedious for as much pepper as we're using. So I just went ahead and took about a palm full or a tablespoon or two, and put it in my coffee grinder. I didn't wash it out or anything beforehand, again, because that just seems a little bit too labor intensive. So you might get some flavor of coffee in there, but it should be okay. Now, as you can see, I'm making quite a mess here, but you really want to make sure that every inch of your pork is seasoned. I'm also making sure to keep one hand for my spices and one hand for the pork. I make sure that you don't get any cross contamination happening. And now we're ready to move to our stove top. You'll preheat your pan over high heat. We're going to start by browning our meat. And as you can see, I decided to use a cast iron skillet for this. Um, it retains and distributes heat a lot better than a stainless steel pan. And because we'll be braising this dish for approximately three hours, you're gonna wanna keep all that heat that you can. So the braising technique used in this course can be used for so many different meals. You hear I'm talking about braised short ribs, which is really trendy these days. You can even braise fennel. Uh, it's really used for those tougher pieces that need some extra time. You'll want to add a little bit of oil to your pan. As I mentioned earlier, our pork is going to be a little bit fatty already, so you don't have to add too much. And I usually like to add a little bit of a combination of butter and oil when cooking, but in this case where I'm looking to get a really good crusty brown on it, I'm just going to use the oil because it has a much higher smoking point than the butter does. Give your pan a swirl. And we're gonna wait until it actually starts to smoke, which you, after you swirl it around a little bit, I definitely see it starting to smoke. So we'll go ahead and add our pork in whole. And you can hear that immediate sizzle. And we're really gonna try and brown it pretty deep. Uh, the braising technique that we'll be using here We'll then add a bunch of liquid to it and continue adding liquid to it while it cooks for the three hours. So you really want to get a good crust established ahead of time, otherwise you're having boiled meat and that's not tasty. It 
it'll probably take a good four or five minutes to get that real crusty brown golden texture we're looking for. And be patient, you don't wanna rush it. It is a big piece of meat and it's pretty cool going into a hot, hot pan. So it will take a while. In all my years of cooking, I've never burnt anything I was trying to brown. So leave it high and leave it long. Once you start to smell it, you'll wanna take a look just to gauge how done you are. Now that is a beautiful brown crust. Give it a flip. And wait again for about five minutes or so until your nose starts to tell you to take a look at it. You'll wanna make sure that you have a good ventilated space if you have a hood that actually does its job, flip it on high. If you rent and your hood doesn't work so well like we do, go ahead and open up all the windows. You're gonna wanna brown every side, top, bottom, every inch of it you wanna get as golden brown as you can. Now once you're done browning all the sides of it, you're gonna to wanna to turn down the heat all the way low. Braising is really about low and slow, and you want to start to add your liquid. I'm going to be using a Mexican style beer. You can use dark or light, whatever you have on hand or whatever you prefer. So now, if you think it's steaming now, it's gonna get really intense for a minute. You'll want to add enough liquid to cover about three quarters or a third of the way up. Really, however much liquid you use the first go around will determine on how long you can wait until you come back and check it the next time. With braising, the time in between checking is really determined by how high the heat is and how much water or liquid you have in there right now. So once things start to settle down and you're able to gauge how much liquid's in there, you can add a little bit more, which I think we will. And then you throw the lid on it. Just to be safe, I like to check mine every 30 minutes. And again, it does take about two and a half or three hours till you really get that shred by a fork tender. We've reached the 30 minute mark. And now let's take a look and see what we're working with. It's really maintained a lot of its liquid already. So I don't think we need to add any more, but I do think we should give it a turn. Beautiful. From here, I noticed that there's barely a simmer going on. So I'm gonna turn it up just a little bit so that we can maintain a little bit of a slight simmer and check it in another 30 minutes. We're now at the one hour mark with our carnitas. Let's see how we're doing. Oh, it smells so good, so rich. And we really still have quite a bit of liquid in there. I'm gonna give it one more turn. We don't think we need to add any more. But at this point, I do want to see how tender it is. You can see that it's starting to fall away from the bone, which is a good sign. But it still is pretty tough. So we still have a ways to go. So we'll keep waiting and recheck in another 30 minutes. We've now hit the hour and 30 minute mark. Let's see how it looks. Just continues to smell better and better. And if you can see, some of the bubbles have started to get, started to get very thick and rich. So you wanna keep an eye on it at that point. You know that there's a lot of fat and not a lot of water in that. We'll also take a look and see if it's fork ready yet. And we're almost getting there. It goes in pretty easy, but definitely doesn't pull out. So we'll give it a turn. Oh, 
Oh, that color is perfect. And at this point, I will add some more liquid. With braising, it's always more flavorful to use a wine or a stock or a beer. But if you prefer to use a non-alcoholic beverage, you can always use the stock or just water. But you'll definitely get more flavor if you use a liquid that has some flavor. It wasn't until the hour and a half mark that we started to add more liquid in. So you know that you can get away with leaving it sitting on the stove for a little bit longer than 30 minutes without checking it. But it's always exciting to see what progress you've made. The lid goes on and we wait another 30 minutes. We've now waited ever so patiently for two hours. Let's see what our work has accomplished. It's beautiful. The meat is starting to pull away from the bone, so you know it's starting to get ready. Theoretically, you know it's done when you can pull the bone right out. And, oh, but the rest of it is almost tender. This one came off with very little effort. So we'll give it a turn. I think we can probably wait for another half an hour or so until that bone falls right off. And by turning it, you don't only continue to brown it as you turn it, but you then keep on basting it in that sauce that is so rich and so concentrated with flavor. We'll wait another 30 minutes and I think we might be done. So at about the two hour and 20 minute mark, I started to smell a really intense aroma. It wasn't quite burning yet, but it definitely called me back to the kitchen. So when I opened it up, I noticed that we were pretty out of liquid, which was surprising considering that we had so much just 20 minutes before. But what I did is I just went ahead and added a little bit more to it, gave the meat just a pull up to make sure that all of that new liquid could get in there. And it'll deglaze all of the burnt or roasted bits, whatever word you want to put to it, and pull it all off the pan that we'll put back on our pork once we shred it down. So we'll see how tender it is. You can see how it's just started to relax and fall open a little bit. And when you give it a pull, it hardly stays together, which is a good sign. So just trans, just move it to a plate and pull up all the bits that you can from it. And we'll leave this on and give it a good stir with maybe a little bit more beer to it just so that we can pull up all of that crusty bits and make a really nice sauce to pour over the shredded meat. I'm just gonna run my fork along the bottom of the pan, trying to pull up all of those little tasty bits. But really as the beer cooks in there, it should pull them all up. move this to the side so that we can so that you can see how I'm going to shred it. It's very hot. We just pulled it out of what's been cooking for two and a half hours now. So just run your fork through it. And it's going to pull apart perfectly. I'm going to work around the bone first so I can make some space. All right. Set that aside. And from here, it kind of just depends on how big you want your, your pieces. You know, if you know that you're going to 
have some now and save the others for later. Keep some whole. That's going to keep them more moist than if you shred it all up now. There you go. It takes some muscle to get started. But as you can see, it just really is tender and falls apart. And as I mentioned earlier, our household really prefers carnitas tacos. So I think we have enough that we can start assembling our delicious tacos. Now before we start plating, I want to take your attention back to the sauce that we were making. All of the brown bits have pulled up. But I want to go ahead and pour some of this right back onto our shredded carnitas. Gives it some extra flavor. It'll keep it moist. Beautiful color. From here, I've charred up a corn tortilla on the stove. Add a little bit of your carnitas to it. And my favorite toppings are some avocado, some green salsa, a little bit of sour cream, the pico de gallo, and a little bit of roasted pasilla chili. The pasilla chilies add a nice sweetness and a little bit of spice to it. Roll it up and take a bite. Mmm. The carnitas are so tender. The pasilla chilies are sweet. Sour cream is so creamy. And that's how local ambrosia does carnitas. <laughs>